it's a great pleasure to welcome Shao Sung Yan, Dr. Shao Sung Yan. And actually, we are welcoming him, him back because he did his PhD here at ITPA, and his advisor was Professor Edmund Chang. So after Shao Sung left Stony Brook, he was a research associate at COLA, the Center for Ocean, Land, Atmosphere Studies in Calverton, uh, Maryland, which is a, a uh, institute where they do very high quality research on weather and climate. And after spending two years as a postdoc, uh, Shao Sun was promoted to a, the position of a research scientist at COLA. And then last year, he, he joined the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, GFDL, in Princeton as a project scientist. So I'm very happy to say that Shao Sun has done really very good work. Uh, 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 in his research career, he's very productive, and his uh, many of his papers are very innovative, especially the use of uh, Kalman uh, filter in ensemble runs in improving uh, predictability in models. And he is going to present to us one such study uh, from Princeton, uh, in which he was the lead author. So let us welcome Shao Sung Yan. Thank you, Son, uh, for a nice introduction. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here, and uh, I'm very glad to see my previous professors and my old friends, and also some you know, new faces. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, our recent work about the uh, decadal predictability uh, using GFDL's uh, fully coupled in region and the decade of focus system. So first I would like to thank the uh, sorry. first I would like to thank my co-authors, uh, all of them uh, at, GF, at, at GFL except uh, Team Delso at Cola. So this is a uh, uh, total motivation why we should care about the uh, uh, decadal climate prediction. So this figure shows the, uh, from the IGCC R4 report, this shows the global mean uh, air temperature. Uh, the black is the observed, and the red is uh, the multi-model mean. So the shading, the, the shading is multi-model ensemble. So you will see the, you know, all the models seem to capture this uh, uh, forced response to the uh, anthropogenic forcing. But however, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, regional scale, there are a lot of uh, uh, observed decadal variability. For example, in this plot I showed is uh, uh, Atlantic margin decadal oscillation index. So basically this is North Atlantic SST average. So you will see in this regional scale, uh, this shows this uh, margin decadal uh, variation. Also, there are you know other type of decadal uh, observation like PDO and the Sahel rainfall and even like the Asian monsoon. So the thing is, you know, can we predict this kind of uh, uh, internal variability at the decadal time scale? Uh, this is a very a brief introduction. What is the decadal climate prediction? So decadal climate prediction uh, wants to predict some lateral internal variability, like AMO, PDO. And also, uh, this uh, uh, decadal prediction is a new uh, core experiment of CB5 model uh, comparison project. And uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, the new things uh, compared with Air 4 because Air 4 mainly uh, want to detect how model can uh, simulate the response to the uh, anthropogenic forcing. So, uh, decadal climate prediction is uh, uh, mathematically, you can say, or physically, you can say, the joint initial value and the boundary value problem. So, for the boundary value problem, uh, if you prescribe this forcing, you can predict the uh, forced climate change signal. And uh, uh, for the initial value problem, you want to predict this uh, uh, internal part. So, if we want to uh, Doing this forecast, you have to uh, initialize this uh, 
uh, common model uh, to solve this linear value problem. So basically, uh, in the uh, climate community, uh, immunization is, uh, is basically, it's, uh, we want to have a, a model state which combines the forecast and the observation uh, using some uh, optimization techniques. Uh, this technique also called you know, data science. <laughs> And uh, later on, I will show you, uh, at the GPL, we use the ensemble coupled data simulation system. So we simulate uh, ocean, uh, atmosphere, and even in future, like the ice, you know, different components. So this, uh, this is uh, uh, the diagram, is, uh, is we call, uh, people call it synthesis with a climate prediction problem. So this is from a uh, recent review paper of Hosking. So here, it shows that you know we are taking a different uh, time scale of prediction from the uh, weather days to a seasonal scale and decadal scale and uh, a century scale. So the so so the upper shows you know if we want to do a day a weather type of uh, prediction, you may need to just think about uh, use atmospheric initial condition. But if you extend more, you have to include uh, other uh, climate system components like the ocean, land, and even longer, you have to consider the ice part. So the red shows, you know, uh, the, represents the current understanding of this uh, 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 seamless prediction problem. For example, we have to do a good job at the weather to a week, you know, this time scale. And also we do the seasonal climate prediction and also, we uh, say, like the, as I sh mentioned before, in the AR5, we have uh, a good sense, you know, how the model uh, re uh, responds to the anthropogenic forces. But uh, we have several gaps here. One of the gaps is, say, like the MGO type of the monthly, the time scale. And uh, today, I'm talking about this kind of gap uh, between the season and this uh, uh, century uh, scale. So, uh, from the uh, prediction point of view, for this kind of a seamless weather climate prediction, requires you know we have to initialize uh, all these uh, uh, components in the uh, this coupled climate system. So uh, when you do the initialization, then you do the prediction, but that's not a story of the you know the science. So we have to do uh, some diagnostic works, you know. Uh, especially, we want to make sure we get the right result for the right reason. So basically, it's a scientific basis for the, uh, the prediction. And uh, uh, for this uh, uh, decadal uh, predictability, because uh, when we do the uh, initialization, then we integrate the model. See, the forecast uh, have two components. One is uh, uh, internal part. Another part is uh, the uh, force part. So the thing is, you know, uh, can we separate these two? Also, uh, we want to know, uh, as I said before, uh, this is a seamless. So in your forecast, it's a marginal scales. They have seasonal interannual and decadal to marginal decadal. So how can we detect, you know, uh, the patterns in different uh, scale? Or, uh, the interest question of this is, can we detect you know, where are these uh, uh, decadal signals? Because especially, uh, we do not have the experience of this uh, decadal predictability. This is very important. <coughs> so uh, later on, I will introduce a uh, <coughs> new uh, technology. It's uh, average predictability time. Uh, we call it ABD. This is developed by Delta and uh, uh, Michael Tibbe. I think Michael Tibbe also have a similar here this year. <coughs> So first, I want to introduce you know uh, our ensemble uh, coupled data simulation uh, framework. So this framework is developed by uh, Shorten Zhang at GPL. Uh, I think he, he you know developed this uh, ensemble coupled framework for about a decade. So this technique right now, uh, so simply speaking, is uh, say if you have a, a observation, you have some. Uh, PDF of the observation, and also you have the background, or we can say uh, model forecast. You also have the uh, PDF. So 
data simulation, we call it filtering. It's just you combine these two observation and the forecast. Then you have the uh, analysis. So the unique thing is here. So uh, because right now for this climate community, uh, a lot of reanalysis leads to individually. For example, uh, for the weather uh, forecast, they use just uh, to the uh, atmospheric data simulation. For the ocean, is uh, they use ocean model to do the data simulation, but not in the carbon framework. So here we do the uh, atmosphere data simulation and the ocean data simulation together. So it's in, in the carbon framework. Uh, so here I just introduce uh, what is the data we assimilate in this system. So right now, you know, for the atmosphere part, we do not uh, assimilate the in-suit, the observation data. We just take the NSF analysis as the uh, observations. But in the ocean, we do assimilate the uh, different type of all the available uh, ocean observations, like the earlier uh, FPT type of observation, and later on, the satellite SFTs and warrants and uh, the other. So we should be careful, you know, this, uh, uh, due to this uh, uh, observation system change that will introduce uh, some uncertain type of forcing to this analysis. But right now, we haven't attacked that problem, just to use all the available uh, observation or simulation system. So we have this, uh, uh, you have this filter and the data, we have these products. So right now we have the uh, cohort analysis products, we have like the uh, 50 years. We are simulate six hourly atmosphere data and daily ocean data. So for the ensemble member, uh, the previous version we have 12, but right now the new one we have 48 uh, ensemble members. So here, uh, I want to emphasize this advantage of the coupled, uh, ensemble coupled data simulation. Because um, using ensemble, so it's like the multivariate analysis. So it will maintain the physics balance between state variables. For example, the uh, ocean you know, temperature and the salinity relationship. Uh, for the atmosphere, like the uh, maintain the uh, geostrophic balance. Also, uh, because it's coupled, so all the coupled components, uh, they can instantaneously exchange fluxes. So because of these two, uh, these products uh, have the minimum initial coupling charge. So it turns out this one is very uh, practically, it's very important for the, uh, you know, coupled, uh, for the climate prediction, uh, or seasonal or decadal. So uh, later on I will show you uh, after we use this ensemble uh, coupled data simulation, we have a dramatic improvement of the answer prediction. Uh, also, uh, I, I, I think later I will show uh, we have some skill of the AMO uh, prediction. So this is an example uh, of the ANSO variability. So the <coughs> in the first plot I showed is uh, uh, SST anomalies in different ANSO uh, regimes, uh, Nino 4 and 3.4 and Nino 3. So basically you can see uh, the ECDA and the observation, uh, they are consistent with each other. So the uh, very important message is uh, uh, we also capture this uh, uh, profile, the vertical profile of the uh, temperature. Actually, the, uh, for the ANSO, uh, it turns out, you know, uh, the strong signal is not really at the surface. They have the uh, at the subsurface. So uh, we uh, have this subsurface uh, uh, information. You can get more information for uh, the answer prediction. So here is uh, the uh, answer prediction scheme. So the left panel shows the uh, anomaly correlation coefficients. <coughs> So the, uh, the upper panel shows the uh, 3D bar, uh, the uh, data simulation system. Uh, the bottom shows the uh, ECDA, so the coupled uh, data simulation. So this is forecast uh, initial time uh, at the calendar month from January to December. Uh, this is the leading time uh, we have uh, forecast for 12 months. 
So if you compare with two, we can see that you know, uh, for the uh, if you use uh, around the correlation coefficient, the scale uh, is much better uh, using the EPA. For example, what are the coefficients is too hard to read. Oh, okay. Yeah, the uh, the red is uh, for this correlation coefficient is above uh, uh, point eight, and uh, the 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 brown is above point seven. So that means, you know, especially if you look at this, you will see, you know, uh, the answer prediction even at uh, uh, 10 mid high months, you have very good skill. But, you know, we have to say, you know, it's not for all the mid time, it's seasonal dependent. But it's much better than the Suriva. So the root mean square error is the same thing. So you will see uh, the ECDA is much better. So, so, the, yeah, sure. yeah. so the, I was just wondering, so you say a normal correlation, what? what? Oh, okay. Oh, uh, okay. This is uh, uh, yeah. That's good. It's, this is Angel. I think is a new uh, new three index. So yeah, predict you know, compare with other things. Right. And the three D bar means the initialization for the patterns here also separately or? Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. But you know, uh, we choose just to uh, uh, compare with our own 3D bar, you know. So because this one, uh, this you, you can't claim too much is because people will argue, you know, that we use different data or something, you know. But we at internally we think this very, you know, uh, improvement here. So uh, right now uh, we sort of in extend this uh, uh, seasonal prediction to the decadal prediction. So first, we want to make sure, you know, in this uh, ECDA system, do you capture this, uh, uh, you know, decadal signal? So here I showed is North Atlantic uh, heat content, uh, top 300 meters. So uh, the shading shows the ECDA, and the black line shows the uh, the MODC observation. So this is a UF1. Uh, this is time series, and this is pattern. So you see the pattern, uh, they are pretty close, and especially the time series, they also show this uh, uh, multi decadal uh, variation. So that means, you know, the data simulation capture this uh, multi uh, the decadal signal. So, uh, right now, you know, as I mentioned before, uh, in this decadal uh, high test, uh, we want to uh, separate uh, this uh, uh, you know internal part from the uh, anthropogenic forcing response. So what we do is like this. This diagram, you know, a schematic diagram shows how we do separating uh, these two parts. So assuming we have two uh, simulations, one is uh, uninitialized. So that means you know you do not do any uh, data simulation. So you just do ensemble uh, forecast with the uh, prescribed uh, forced. Uh, force, uh, forcing. Then you have another set. You have you do the data simulation. For example, here show I I show the forecast every ten years. So this is initial forecast. So that means you, when you do the data simulation, you introduce this uh, uh, internal uh, variability, like the you know uh, decadal part. Then we use the uh, same model, and uh, for these two uh, simulations external forcing is identical. So the, then uh, we can uh, separate these two. So the assumption is the force response is the same for these two uh, experiments. So we use the ensemble mean. This is a black line. Uh, we estimate this uh, force response. Then we subtract out this force one uh, at, uh, from this uh, initialized high test. So we get this part. So you will see, you know, there's no uh, forced uh, signal here. And uh, another method here is, you know, we are deal with the uh, realistic or uh, the quasi operational forecast. So model has a bias. So you will see, you know, at each uh, forecast time, you know, they are not really track the observation. They have tendency to go back to the uh, the model state. So we have to. Uh, one more step is remove this bias. So what we do here is we are assuming the bias is systematic with the D time. So that means we subtract the clamp tolerance 
uh, different climatology at each heat time. So after that, you know, you will see uh, what you left is just uh, internal residuals. So then we diagnose this uh, uh, predictability in these uh, uh, internal residuals. So then uh, also the message here is all these internal residuals, that means you gain from the uh, data simulation. So uh, as I mentioned before, I use uh, APD. So here I uh, will use five, uh, five slides about to introduce the uh, APD. So first, what is the uh, definition of the uh, predictability? So here I show an uh, example, uh, the ensemble forecast using an error one process model. So for example, at the first, uh, your model error is small. Then the model error is developed when you know, your uh, lead time uh, increase. So in this area, in this regime, we say uh, the model has some uh, you know, skill, or you say it's predictable. But uh, eventually, the, uh, the model ensemble is, uh, uh, is collapsed to the climatology. So that means you cannot distinguish the signal from the climatology. So in this region, is uh, we call it unpredictable. So the the measure of this predictability is uh, we can say uh, use this uh, climatology error minus the forecast error, then normalize by this uh, climatology error. So you will see at lead time zero is one, then uh, when the lead time goes to infinity, the predictability uh, disappears. So what is the average? Average means you, know, you just uh, uh, integral all this uh, predictability over all the lead time. So for example, this is a, a different time scale of AR1 process. So one is have a, a larger FAP value. So if you integrate, for example, the red is like a 40 uh, time unit. The blue process, the FAP is like 20. So if you integrate, you can separate these two uh, signals. So this is a, a one big problem. So then, if you want to uh, optimize this APT, uh, this is uh, you know developed by Delso and DBA. So if you want to find the projection of the data that maximize APT, so the solution is uh, you just solve this uh, uh, generalized eigenvalue problem. So the uh, forecast variance is turned to be the Q variance. And uh, the climatology is the uh, error is climatological covariance metric. So if you know this uh, covariance metric, you can solve it. So uh, the eigenvalue gives you the uh, APT, and the eigenvectors is the projection vectors for generalize, generating the time series. Then you can result in from this uh, uh, analysis, result in time series they are uncorrelated in time. And uh, you also can find a pattern. So if you product the pattern and the time series, you can you know, uh, recover the original time series. So the, this one, this technique you can think about is analogous to UF. The only difference is UF is uh, ranked with the, uh, you know, the amount of variance, but ABT is ranked with the time series. So uh, it's, it's a little bit subtle, you know, if you want to estimate APT use just one ensemble member. It's because, you know, uh, it's very hard to get this uh, uh, forecast variance. So practically, you have to construct a, a multivariate linear regression model to determine uh, this uh, uh, forecast variance. Then you can solve it. So for this technique, you know, if you use one ensemble member, the limitation is you may miss nonlinear predictability. But uh, I will I will show you later. I you know, for the our uh, decade of high test, we have ensembles, so we don't have do not have to solve this problem. Just use ensemble to determine this uh, forecast Q variance. So in this framework, you know, because uh, uh, it's decomposing predictability, 
So in this uh, particular uh, battery, you can see, uh, you can uh, you know, separate, say, for the multi decade uh, you have strong, stronger productivity at long lead time, and then they came on the seasonal and the weather. So this code is a sort of seamless type of framework for diagnosing uh, predictability. So here, because I'm interested in the uh, uh, decadal part, so here I show an example uh, using this ABT for the decadal predictability. So this is a leading uh, predictable component of SST in the CV3 on four simulations. This is de uh, determined from uh, not one model, multiple models. So this pattern shows, you know, uh, the decadal signals, uh, mostly in the uh, North Atlantic and uh, uh, Pacific Ocean, and also you will see the in different models the time series they show uh, this this axis in years is they show the multi decadal uh, variation. So then uh, we use this technique, you know, to apply to our uh, decadal time test. So uh, this is a brief uh, introduction of what is the what are the uh, high test. So we have uh, uh, initial condition from uh, the ensemble carbon data simulation system, and uh, the high test initialized on January first every year from 1961 to 2011. And uh, for each initial condition, we have ten member ensemble, uh, ten ensemble members, and the forecast includes the lateral and uh, anthropogenic forces. And we look at the annual average SST and uh, uh, two meter temperature. So the total, uh, you know, forecast year is uh, uh, 5,100 years. And also, as I said, you know, how to separate? We need uh, another uh, experiment. We call this ten level uh, historic forcing simulation. So we get the forced response. So then uh, we get the uh, high test anomalies. We remove the bias, then uh, we subtract this uh, force response. We get the internal residuals. So after we get these uh, uh, internal residuals, we can estimate uh, ABT. So as I said, uh, here we do not use a, a, a linear regression model to determine this forecast variance. So this one could be uh, approximated by the ensembles. It's like the ensemble computer. Also, uh, in the in practical, when we solve this um, uh, generalized eigenvalue problem, we cannot, you know, uh, do it do with the original covariance because uh, uh, <coughs> our data dimension, the model dimension, is huge. So we have to uh, do the. Uh, Dimension reduction. We solve everything in the UF space. So this is the uh, eigenvalues uh, from the APD analysis for the SST and the t, t uh, two meter temperature. So here the the upper panel shows the APD values for the uh, we have because we have uh, used thirty UFs. So you will see the leading one. Uh, the APD values is about uh, for the SST about. Uh, 19, the temperature is about 18. So it's, it's, from here you will see this is decadal, you know, time scale. Uh, also I show this uh, uh, fraction of explained variance for each component. So you will see, you know, uh, the variance is, because this technique is decomposed by the time scale, so the variance could be random. <coughs> So for the <coughs> for the SST is like seven percent for the temperature is like five percent. So here, what I showed is uh, uh, the ABT of, of the SST. This is a leading component. So the pattern, of what I uh, here you can see, this uh, the general structure is there is an interhemisphere cycle. So in North Hemisphere, in two. Atlantic and the Pacific is warm, and uh, in the Southern Ocean is cold. But the strong signal is in the uh, North Atlantic, North Atlantic Ocean. <coughs> so uh, this plot 
uh, there are several methods here. Let me explain point by point. So first, uh, this blue one is the AMO index. I think this show is 1920 to 2020. Our forecast period is here, from 1961 to here. So this pattern we derived from this time period. And then uh, the ERSST, this one, is we project this pattern to the uh, ERSST observation data. And the, uh, the green, we project this pattern to the heartland uh, SST data. So from here, you can see uh, in this period, this time series also follow this MO index. So this kind of uh, or, uh, independent uh, check of the robustness of this pattern. Because you know, uh, this is uh, we do not use the data in this period. And uh, <coughs> this uh, the solid uh, line here is the ensemble mean uh, forecast. The shading represents the ensemble uh, breadth. So what I plot is uh, you know every ten years, and the here is also every ten years, just uh, for different initial conditions. So the basic message is you know. Uh, the high pass, they can follow uh, this kind of uh, the observation. So, because this is our uh, first exercise, you know, for the decadal uh, predictability, so we want to make sure this pattern is, uh, you know, is right or not. So we find one uh, in the observation. So this is a medium trend uh, in from 1980 to 2004 is because you know the MO is low phase uh, around 1980 uh, is in the uh, warm phase in 2004. So the medium trend in this period represents the uh, you know the MO pattern. So you will see uh, the observation also show uh, the warm in the northern hemisphere and the cold in the southern ocean and also the strong signal in the North Atlantic. So it seems you know we have got you know reasonable uh, results, but uh, the advantage of this is you know we can use the dynamic model to predict this pattern. So then you know we sort of are following uh, the practical way you know to show your forecast what is the scale. So uh, we, as I said, I use the observation data for the SST. We use two ER SST and Hubble Center SST. And for the um, two meter temperature, we use NSAP NCAR analysis. And also we use 20th century analysis. So this is details of calculation steps. So first, uh, because we want to do the uh, verification of the pattern, so we first project observation on this uh, uh, predictable component to, to, refer, to find the observed time series uh, of this pattern. Then we compute the <coughs> ACC uh, between observation and the forecast at each week time. Uh, and uh, also, uh, we compute ACC for our dynamic model high pass. We also uh, compare with uh, uh, persistent model. So persistent model means you know forecast equal to initial condition. So why we compare with uh, persistent model is because uh, uh, we just learn from the seasonal forecast. Because uh, at first stage of seasonal prediction, we also uh, use this uh, uh, persistent model to uh, represent the very simple statistics model for comparison. So then we do the statistical test. Uh, this is the uh, first one we use the, to test uh, if uh, this uh, correlation if is significant from zero or not. Also, we, use, we do another test to test if these two scales are different or not. So this is uh, not really that widely you know, used in our community. But here, we want to really make it more rigorous, so we do one more step, not just showing uh, this you know, scale is larger or not. We want to see if they are significantly different or not. So this is a uh, skill for the prediction SST. <coughs> so the, the, the black dot is the skill, the, uh, 
columnar correlation of our high test. This verification use the ERSSP. And the green squares is the persistent model. And these two dash line represent uh, the black one is for the high test. This is the threshold value, 95 percent threshold value. The dots is the 90 percent threshold value, and uh, the green one is for the uh, threshold value for the persistent forecast. So from here we can see uh, the model scale. We have uh, like four of four years at uh, 95 percent uh, significant, and ten years uh, at 90 percent significant. But uh, persistent skills, they have uh, three years at 95 and five years at 95, 90% uh, significant. So then <clears throat> we want to do another test is to see uh, if this uh, black dot is significantly better than this uh, uh, the green square. So here uh, we show the p-value. So from here we can see uh, at this, uh, you know, first say, uh, Seven year lead time, it's hard to separate these two. But uh, uh, later on, you know, we can see the model is kind of better than the uh, persistence at 75% uh, significant level. So, <clears throat> because, you know, that one, the, I showed the pattern, you know. Uh, another thing we want to double check if this is an uh, artifact of this ABD analysis. So we just now we just look at the uh, the uh, strong signals from the ABD analysis just in North Atlantic SST. So what we plot is just North Atlantic SST residues. We don't do anything. So here again a similar plot. You know the black is the uh, forecast and the shady is ensemble spread. And uh, this is the ER SST. So you will see, you know, uh, the initialized one, we have the multi decadal variation associated uh, following this uh, uh, N0. But uh, another message here is if you look at the uninitialized, the historically policy one, they do not have this uh, uh, multi decadal variation. So this highlights, you know, the importance of this uh, uh, beta simulation. You introduce this uh, uh, decadal internal signal then the model can follow this, uh, uh, follow this uh, multi decay variation. So again, we can check the scale. The model scale, they have uh, uh, seven, uh, four, seven years at different significant level. And also we can see model is better than uh, persistent. So we, we do similar thing for the uh, two meter temperature. So this is a leading pattern. So again, uh, most of the signal is in the uh, North Atlantic and the Greenland and uh, extended to, uh, you know, mostly in the uh, total area. And uh, Southern Hemisphere, they also have the, the opposite, the cold, but the uh, signal is much weaker. So this is a sort of, people call it the bipolar system. And uh, uh, this is uh, the, uh, the amplitude of this uh, pattern, the time series. Uh, again, this is uh, forecast and this is observation. So you see uh, the time series uh, following in phase with MO. Uh, and uh, even in this uh, uh, independent period, you will see the uh, project uh, pattern, the time series, the observed time series of the pattern uh, correlated with this. Uh, uh, MO index. So uh, for the you know for this temperature by bipolar pattern, at first we are not sure you know, if we get the right answer. But eventually we find one is uh, uh, this one. What it showed is the differentiated Arctic and uh, Antarctic temperature transfer. They are just uh, you know opposite. This this shows the uh, this uh, you know uh, seesaw type, of, and also they correlate with the MO. So we are pretty you know confident now. You know we are get something that's uh, physically consistent 
with the uh, observation. And uh, we do similar things for the uh, the scale of the two meter temperature. So uh, the model we have two uh, years at 95, 10 years at 90 percent acidity rate. And also we can show the model is better than the persistent forecast. So uh, as I said before, you know we want to uh, say. Uh, after we get this gear, we want to make sure you know we have uh, understanding this. So this is uh, we want to see what is the possible sourcing of this uh, variability. So the uh, the Atlantic market, uh, the Atlantic uh, Maritime Ocean Circulation Theory, uh, it says you know there is an in phase relationship between the uh, lost Atlantic heat transport and SST. So basically it says if air market is stronger, you have stronger. Uh, Forward heat transport, then you have warmer uh, loss of energy SST. So here I compute a, a regression uh, at each uh, latitude uh, between uh, the heat transport, uh, the, the regression between heat transport at each grade point with the uh, AMO index. So the, the black is in the high test, and the red is uh, our data simulation system. So both we show, you know, the regression coming is a positive. That means they are uh, also the uh, this uh, sign, you know, the plus sign means uh, they pass ninety five percent signal level. So which means, you know, uh, ECDA and uh, the high test uh, agree with this theory. So here I show this uh, <coughs> the uh, heat transport. And this is average between uh, 35 and uh, 65. So this is, this is uh, the solid is the high test. The red is the ECDA for this uh, the time period. And the blue is historic forcing. So the important message here is if you just look at the historic forcing, uh, they are weakly. But uh, if you do the uh, data simulation, because ECDA, they show some some degree of the margin decadal uh, variation. So we have some problem, uh, maybe this year, but we don't know the reason yet. So, but anyway, you know, after this uh, initialization, you will see, uh, especially uh, before 1990, you have uh, uh, basically it's weaker heat transport. So after 1990, you have stronger. So this kind of uh, uh, support, you know, we have some dynamic in this uh, uh, in the decade of high test. So uh, because right now, you know, for this uh, uh, decade of high test, a uh, decade of prediction, especially for the AMO evolution, like the ninety-five, you know, from cold phase to warm phase. There are still a lot of debate you know, whether it's internal or whether it's uh, forced. So we do another uh, test. So here is we uh, do an experiment called a fixed forcing experiment. So we want to test what high test looks like without time varying uh, forcing. So if you know if you uh, the the forcing does not change, you get the similar answer. Then it will say okay, uh, the internal part is important. So uh, this is a control run, you know, control high test. We have a uh, uh, changing uh, forcing with time. But right now, we fix this value of the forcing. Uh, as it, when you forecast, you know, this one does not change. The, these two experiments, the initial conditions are the same. So then we see what it, what is the, what it look like. So, <coughs> This is a, a fixed forcing experiment. So we uh, fix these uh, forcing values is equal to 1961 values. And as I said, condition is the same. So in this plot, I showed is uh, the red is control uh, high test, and the blue is fixed forcing uh, uh, high test. So you will see, you know, for the North Atlantic, uh, especially. Uh, at the 
earlier stage, you don't really see the too much difference. Only you see something, you know, for the uh, like the uh, 2005 initial team, a little bit uh, cooling. But if you look at the heat transport from 35 to 65, they are they are almost the same. But uh, if you look at global mean, because you know global mean is just controlled by the forcing, so you will see uh, in the fixed forcing, you know, they have the uh, fast cooling. This is consistent with uh, you know Asian health. You know, they have the paper about say if you return your forcing to the pre-industrial uh, value. The mean response is just like the fast cooling, very, 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 very fast time scale. In three or four years, you know, they just uh, the cooling down. So the this message says, you know, uh, because this heat transport does not change, and then uh, it will highlight, you know, uh, our forecast is because you know the ocean internal dynamics is important here. So, uh, also there is a, what I show here is, you know, for the, this decade of prediction, uh, there are different, you know, view here. So one example is, you know, uh, this is from a new paper uh, in Nature. So what they show is, uh, this is their uh, Earth system model, is uh, from, uh, you can find their simulated extended five data icon. So what they show here is North Atlantic, as a, as a team. So this is model simulation and <laughs> this is observation. So we'll see, you know, they are pretty close. So in this view, that means, you know, uh, if you want to predict MO, you don't have to do this, uh, uh, say, data simulation evaluation. So they said, okay, MO could be a response to the aerosol forcing. So I just put it here, you know, but I think, I believe, you know, what we showed, we do a lot of experiment and we, we basically argue, you know, internal is important. And also, uh, we require uh, this uh, uh, data, data simulation. So this is uh, uh, the summary. Uh, so uh, basic message is, uh, you know, we have something, even this is post exercise. So the important message I'm trying to uh, emphasize is uh, uh, the initialization is very important. Especially, uh, we deal with this, uh, you know, different components. They are coupled together. How to uh, do this uh, innovation? And uh, the results is very encouraging. You know, if you say using this uh, ensemble coupled uh, innovation technique. But uh, uh, obviously, also, you know, we we have to have a better better model. So, uh, what is the challenge problem for this? Uh, Decade of climate prediction. So first, as I said, you know we assuming uh, the model bias is uh, systematic, but uh, we know when you the model bias, you know, will this uh, they will grow so when you integrate uh, longer. So how can we deal with this model bias? You know, so uh, one thing maybe you know you we have to say improve your model and uh, or increase the um, higher uh, model resolution. So we don't know, we, we have to, right now we, we have uh, several uh, ongoing research. One is you know using high resolution uh, couple model to do this uh, data simulation and for the future uh, forecast, decade forecast. Also we do uh, think about, you know we do some uh, parameter estimation in the data simulation, try to adaptively tune the model parameter. So if you can, uh, you know, uh, find a uh, best tuned parameter, you will you know, basically improve your model. So also uh, another way is uh, right now in our uh, data simulation, we only have uh, atmosphere and ocean. We do not include the land, land component and ice component. So in future, we are working on uh, including, you know, all of these components. And uh, uh, also, uh, you know, another part we have to be careful is uh, actually what I showed at scale in the 10 years, they're pretty high, it's like 0 0.7, 0 0.6, you know. But we should be careful is uh, even we have 50 years, you know, 50, uh, 50 year uh, 
forecast. But uh, the degree of freedom is not fifty. So that's why you know your uh, the scale is very hard to assess. Basically, in these fifty years, we only have one one table cycle. So if you want, if we want to, you know, make a very robust uh, model scale for the decade prediction, uh, like you know the ANSO prediction for the system forecast, because for ANSO we have so many many observation cases to assess, you know, this uh, model scale. But now, uh, you know, due to some limitation of the observation network, we only have uh, say about one or two, you know, cycles. So in future, so how we say do say like the 20th century, you know, uh, innovation, then we can uh, look at you know how model can uh, predict more events. So the, the point is, you know, right now I show okay, I can predict you know the latest one, but we don't know, you know, for new say animal cycle, can we predict? We don't know because you know we don't have uh, so many cases. So I think that's all. Thank you. Every 10 years. Actually, that's not. That's, you know, for the sending part, okay. they just request you submit every five years, I think. Okay. But uh, in reality, we do every year. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you do every year. Right, right. But yeah. the prediction itself is only 10 yeah, years. Yeah, only 10 years. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. the initial condition is on the envelope of multi decadal variable. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. So uh, do you know? Any effort that people try to predict the actual the, the actual multi decadal variation? No, we no this because you know why we do ten years. That's because you know they simplify the they have designed these experiments. They just uh, uh, first you know just say oh, okay because this is the first exercise you know, just stay on ten years. So I believe you know based on our results you know even ten years we have some skill. So maybe you can expect more you know say. We in future we will like try twenty. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah. Could you elaborate a little bit more how you spin up the, the ocean? Or oh, spin up? Yeah. Oh actually right now, you know, we, because this is a couple of data simulations, we do not uh, uh, we have spin up because uh, uh, this data simulation, you know, is uh, uh, we have uh, sort of analysis from nineteen sixty one to present. But our filter running starting from uh, 1940. So that means you have like 10 or even more times for the filter spin up. So because, you know. But you start from which conditions you start? Oh, every, I say, because we do this analysis for the whole 50 years. Every day, you know, for element scale, six hours. So it's very expensive exercise. We do not do then when when we do uh, high cast we do not do any spin ups we just take say uh, January first of each year then do integration that's the forecast so that means you know we do not so have ocean is completely that's no 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 that. we have the no ocean knows we have the data ocean of the region. yeah but I think the point is probably in January nineteen fifty the very initial time. Would need some initial condition motion to start. Uh, which, I'm sorry, which, which? Say, uh -huh. the initial mm -hmm. period is starting from January 1950. Yeah. Then you need some initial condition. Oh, okay. So for that one, I believe we use the, uh, we have the, uh, one is, uh, I said, is historic forcing. So we started from that historic forcing is uh, like you know for the similar time period. We basically we generate an ensemble. So you start let's say in nineteenth century. Yeah. And then you run it for hundred years, and that was when you started, right? 
because ocean needs to be for, for this kind of decadal predictability, you really need to have very good ocean conditions as initial condition. Otherwise, I don't understand how you can even start the thinking. No, so this no, that, that's a different point of view. I think right now we have to think about this. This is you know the ocean is constrained by the observation. Everywhere. In the, in no, it's you know based on you, how many data you have. Not everywhere, but uh, for the. The good news for the ocean is that starting from 2000, we have Argo, you know, we can down to 2000 meters. Yeah, as I said, you know, because ocean network, you know. Argo is only Indian Ocean. What? Argo is only Indian Ocean, basically. In the Indian Ocean? Where nothing much actually happens. Most of the signal is actually North Atlantic and uh, at the equatorial Pacific. That's where actually he gets soaked in into the, into the ocean from atmosphere. But it's not an Indian Ocean, so I don't, I don't understand how Argo can talk to it. What do you mean? I, I, I'm not, Argo I'm is a very limited network. It's uh, Argo, no, Argo is global. It's, well, not, it's mostly Indian Ocean. Uh, I, don't, I don't agree with that, I think. It's not. Yeah. Argo is global. Every country, country, it's sort of, you know, right, uneven, it's even, it's even coverage right. of the global ocean. I don't think Argo is just an Indian Ocean. OK, so we can yeah. discuss that later. Yeah, we can discuss later. Yeah. So Peng Liu has a question. Oh, yeah. I have two questions, not necessarily related to the uh, prediction, uh, it's more about the game itself. Uh, first one, if you use a common model, you need some free one for thousand or even tens of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Can we see any big of all the signals on those free ones? Uh, yes, uh, that's, that's uh, you know, yeah. Because in the, uh, for the AMO type of variability, or, you know, AMAC in this uh, free run. Uh, different model have the different, you know, uh, time period. For our model, uh, we have like uh, 24 or 25 years. On, uh, if you look at just free run, you know, most of the model, they sort of uh, uh, have a shorter time scale of AMO because observation uh, is like 50 to 70 years. Yeah. Uh, well, the other ocean basins, particularly the Pacific Ocean, is there any such much of the grid of uh, um, oscillation or signals comparable to the AMO? Oh yeah, that's that's. Uh, I think observation shows you know you we have some PDO stuff uh, you know, but uh, uh, our we we didn't see too many. Uh, we didn't see you know say multi-year scale of the in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, probably just you know, first one year, so we haven't looked at that. So basically, uh, this one, uh, one, one thing maybe related with this uh, uh, carbon data simulation. So what we found <coughs> is uh, because this one is our first version of these fifty years, that's twelve member, but right now we have uh, forty eight members. So we found you know the uh, analysis, uh, the root mean square error is much better. So I think in future you know we may expect more even in the uh, Pacific Ocean, like the PDO. But you think there, there, there will be some signal in the, in the Pacific Ocean? Also. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You think there's any relationship between these uh, quantitative signals in the ocean basin, at least in the ocean basin? Uh, I, I don't know. That's the open question. I think there are a lot of studies, like the Zhongzhang, you know, at JPL, she has a study you know, how these two basins, they are impact, you know. So like AMO could impact the PDO through the atmosphere bridge. So that's the one of the mechanisms. Also here, what I showed is they, we, they do have the Q variance, you know. Say, uh, I, I believe, you know, the AMO is dominant signal, right? But uh, at the same time, you will see some uh, in-phase relationship in the Pacific Ocean. But definitely, if you look at uh, the you know spectrum or you know the phase, the the they are not in phase. Yeah. Okay, so I'll come. You were talking earlier about when you reinitialize the, the model run based on the previous prediction. You talked about the instantaneous flux correction. Could you tell us more what that is? Oh, that means you know. Uh, the what is instantaneous flux? Oh, instantaneous flux is uh, LT exchange flux. Heat flux. Heat flux momentum. Momentum flux. Yeah. So that, that, you know, all these flux in the common model. So 
what I'm trying to say is, you know, the uh, we are the first. We are right now maybe not. At least, you know, for the CPU five uh, decade of high test, we are the only institution, you know, using this ensemble coupled data simulation framework to initialize this uh, uh, the high test. So uh, other uh, institution or they what they do is, you know, they have coupled model. They take atmosphere part, say you use uh, NCEP, you know, analysis or EC analysis. Then they take other, you know, the ocean component data solution. They are not a couple. So the advantage is here is like one example is for answer prediction is, uh, you know, say your uh, when you couple your atmosphere wind stress should be balanced with the, your sea level height in the ocean or SSD gradient in the Pacific, for example. If they are not balanced, you will excite spirits currently. That will kill your, you know, the the, the prediction signal. So that's that's kind of we say, you know, they are more like the uh, balanced. So is it modified to have enough Q flux correction? No, we don't. Huh? Yeah. So there are no more questions. So let us thank Dr. Yang. <laughs>